Yay, Doris. Good morning, good morning. Buenos días. Buenos días. <laughs> I don't have a camera, that's why. I don't see Vicky. So you will listen yeah, only my voice today. Oh, she, she's... I saw her... Or she got the ah, okay. link. <laughs> Sorry for not knowing what's going on this morning, folks. It, um, but I don't see Vicky. Let me. Shall we get into Second Life and see if Vicky is there? There. Let me get there and then Marta can share the the screen. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm going also. Let's wait for Maggie to arrive. And we got some others arriving too. Yeah. Okay, to start. Here. Ah, perfecto. Okay, mi linda. Okay, mi linda. Bueno. Ajá. Uh -huh. Okay, vamos entonces. So let's let's enjoy the presentation. Now, Vicky. Now, Vicky. Let's introduce Vicky. Would you? Okay, so let's go and enjoy it. And we follow Vicky. Okay. Thanks, Eugenia. Besitos. Cierro mi pantalla. Cierro mi pantalla, Doris. Sí, no, disculpa que no te pude ayudar. Tengo que activar otra cosa en la computadora. Bueno, voy a cerrar y voy a entrar como, como para ver la clase, ¿ok? Ok, besitos. <laughs> I'm glad you like them. Oh, good. Here comes some more folks. I see them coming on the map. Let's see. Who is this out here? This is okay. That's Tom. Okay. Have a seat, please, if you like. All right. So, hello, everyone, and welcome to Odd Professors Museum and Science Center. Oh, what, what happened to my? There we go. Maybe. Anyway. Um, Let's see. Now I have to do all of these things at once. I'm not good at this. All right. In, in 2009, Rochester Institute of Technology, which is my home institution, established RIT Island and offered faculty the opportunity to experiment in virtual reality. And I said yes right away. I was actually quite thrilled. I'd used 2D modeling software called Interactive Physics in the past to make short videos to demonstrate specific kinds of motion. However, it was all two-dimensional and it wasn't interactive. It was certainly better than static black and white diagrams, which is what I was brought up with. So, uh, which is what I was brought up with with textbooks, but Second Life promised promised a much richer experience in physics problem modeling. So teaching physics generally comprises three dimensions, demonstration, lecture and discussion, and lab activities. But I'm going to take a little digression and talk about my students briefly. Um, all of my students are deaf. Communication is a gigantic issue with my students. and. Um, well, of course, everything I say is going to be a generalization, and there are a lot of deaf students who don't fit this particular model I'm talking about. But on average, all of these things are true. The average deaf learner graduates from high school in the United States with a reading level of fourth to eighth grade. <coughs> deaf students are very dependent learners. They don't believe that it's their own efforts that result in learning. And if they fail, it's generally the teacher's fault. And they don't look for ways to support their learning. 
They don't connect previous learning to new learning experiences. Everything is brand new. I've had students ask me what the algebra rules are in a physics classroom, because they know what they are in the math classroom. But they wonder how you do algebra and physics, because of course it must be different. So I've, on this slide, I've included a link to an interesting article that expands on these learning characteristics. And if you're interested, I recommend taking a look. Um, you don't have to write it all down if you want these slides. If you touch this, oh, I'm pointing at it with my finger on my screen. I can't believe this. Uh, if you touch this kind of gold cylinder <laughs> over on the side, you'll uh, get a URL to a copy of all these slides. OK, so now back to lab experiences. Now, ideally, lab activities support and illustrate concepts and principles, and students can connect what they're studying with what they do in lab. However, when your focus is on getting the right answer, whatever that is, labs look like nothing more than complicating busy work. You do the lab, you write it up, and you forget it because it's really your homework that counts. Uh, physics looks like math. And students have taken lots of math classes. They know what to expect from a math class. They can handle math. So since this looks like math, it's probably aimed at solving equations in their minds. And uh, homework is what you need to do to pass the tests. And if you can do the homework, then you're home free. Of course, this is a really simplistic view and a very incomplete one. So my decision was to bring the lab into homework, make the, make the connection explicit and obvious, Whoops. and provide plenty of practice. We were already using an online homework and testing service called WebAssign, and students were familiar with how it works. So I created activities to do in Second Life. They gathered the data in Second Life and did homework with that data on WebAssign. And the result was a much better integration of lab activities with the learning activities that students value, which is their homework mostly. So if anybody wants to discuss this in more depth, I'm happy to do so. But I think maybe you might be more interested in my toys. So here in the auditorium, I've got six exhibits set up. And you'll find activities related to heat transfer. I have a mercury manometer. I have a density activity, buoyancy and volume displacement, accelerated motion in one dimension, and kinetic friction friction. If you go out into the larger area, I've got 23,000 square meters here, so it's a pretty big place. Feel free to um, just roam all over it. You can tell where my borders are by the, the blue banners. But out in the, uh, oh dear. OK, whoops, let's back up a little bit. Each activity has an explanatory sign, and two of them, I have media prims that link to photos of the web assign assignments, so you can see what they look like to the students. Now I'm lost <coughs> with where I am. Oh, yes, OK, here we go. Do, 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 do. Trying to arrange things on my screen. Um, there are lots more activities out there in the Science Center. As I say, it's a very big place. So feel free to roam all over. Some things work better than others. This place is always being tweaked. Some of my uh, activities are four years old or so, five years old. And uh, let's just say I've gotten to be a much better scripter since then. So some of them work better than others. It's still a lot of fun. Now in, whoops, now in the museum, which is in the large building across the lawn, there are activities on the area of plane surfaces, volume and density of regular, oops, let me catch up here, of regular geometric solids, air tracks, rotation of rigid bodies, uniform circular motion, and buoyancy, volume displacement. Out on the lawn, we have uh, free fall towers for, measure, for measuring gravitational acceleration, more experiences in one-dimensional motion. 
and uh, some vector activities, vector components and vector addition. On the west side through the arch is research and development and there you'll find some investigation into ideal gas laws and fluid flow. Whoops. Wait a minute, I didn't want to do that. Okay, um, the fluid flow, Bernoulli's principle, that one isn't working yet, but it looks really cool. So you might like to just look at it as a piece of art, but it doesn't do anything yet. It will. Now on the east lawn, if you go down on the lower level, there are demonstrations of static equilibrium. And there's a tank that we use for investigating specific gravity. And up in the sky platform, you can take the teleporters to get to the sky platform or just fly up to 350 meters and it's right there. Uh, you'll find tanks for specific gravity and tanks for, what's the other one? Buoyancy and volume displacement. And those are really fun because you can actually make the tanks overflow with granite spheres and then they fall off the platform and that, that's kind of fun to watch. The students always really like that. Um, I find that this is a really good way to get students to cooperate with each other on their work too because they can they can come in here anytime they want to and collaborate with each other. It doesn't matter where they are because being second life, they don't have to drive through the snow and the ice of a Rochester winter to work together. Uh, let me see. So I guess that's about it. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them right now. Or you can just wander around. I will wander too. And you can IM me if you have a question. I will teleport over to where you are and try to answer them. Any questions now? Well, my original... Um, is any, uh, you know, I'd better write this out because I'm not sure everybody's got voice. Does that answer your question, Maggie?
Oh, all right. Okay, quickly then, here, I'm going to summarize in voice now. Okay, um, at the beginning, of course, when I started, RIT had RIT Island, and the presence of that island supported my work. Uh, I didn't have enough room on RIT Island and decided to move off and buy my own space, which I did here. And uh, that was lucky because in 2011, RIT took RIT Island offline because of the um, Linden Labs decision to end the educational discount. But I was already established here. So now I pay my own tier and uh, I do my own thing, but everybody that I have shown this work to at RIT has been very enthusiastic about it and kind of intrigued by how it all works and what I'm doing with it. And um, I have an article in review right now for the Journal of Science Education for Students with Disabilities. And I wrote it mainly because my chairperson kept saying, you, you need to get this out to a wider audience. You need to let more people see this. You need to tell more people about this. So I. I don't like writing articles. I like giving presentations. I hate writing. But so I wrote an article and it's in peer review right now. And uh, once I get done with the revisions, I will probably get it published, I hope. Um, but anyway, everybody's been very supportive of it. it it's been a very good experience. And thank you for all of your, your cheerful support here. Other questions? No, that's fine, but wait, I can't see what I'm doing right now. I think my camera is behind a wall and I'm in front of it. So, um, there we go. Okay, there I am. <laughs> okay, well then, do you, do you want me to uh, wander around and demonstrate some of these things? All righty, well, let's see. Over here then. We have, um, this is a piece of equipment for m mixing liquids at different temperatures and using their specific heat capacities to either figure out what the um, temperature of the mixture is or what one of the starting temperatures of either of the liquids is. The, the script controls which one. It just kind of randomly picks one of three options. So you never know exactly what you're going to get. But you click the start button. Well, somebody else can do this. Here, go ahead. Click the start button, somebody. OK. And now, Maggie, you can see what it's saying to you. Nobody else can because it instant messages you. But what is it telling you? Whoops. All right. OK, now try the start button again, then.
Oh, I'm sorry. I turned off my microphone. There we go. Because it took me about two days to get that to mix right. <laughs> so I want it to work. <laughs> and then and then you just click anywhere and it resets and you can start all over again. And let's see, I like I like my manometer too. Does everybody know what a manometer is? This large copper Okay, well this large copper vessel up here, this round vessel, um, changes temperature inside. The you can increase or decrease the temperature and the script will choose which one happens. But when that happens, this U-shaped tube that's full of mercury, the level of the mercury in the arms is going to change. And you can calculate the pressure inside the vessel from the difference in the level of these uh, of the mercury in the arms. So let me see. I'll start it again. Unfortunately, these things instant message the operator. So I'm the only one that will be able to see what it's saying. I'll read it to you. But you can all play with it if you like. So it says the pressure in the vessel is changing. And you can see the steam and the vibrations. Okay. And then you click on the button again. And it says the mercury in the J-tube is affected by this change in pressure. Watch it move. And there it goes. And then it gives you some information about the atmospheric pressure and the, the actual measured heights of the mercury in the two arms and asks you to calculate the pressure in the vessel. And you can just do it all over again. There it goes. I had to script all that uh, shaking too, which was fun. And click on the button. And it should move. There it goes. So this, this is basically the way a mercury barometer works, but, but it is a lot of fun. And over here, my students don't have a good sense of what density is. Everybody here understands density, right? It's the, um, the mass of one unit, one centimeter cubed or one meter cubed of, of a substance. And it's always the same. If you have a tiny, tiny little piece of copper or a giant block of copper, it has the same density because it's just a ratio of mass to volume. But my students don't understand that. So what they do here is they generate two objects, a cube and a sphere. They get information about the, the dimensions and the mass of these two things. Again, it's being instant messaged to me, but of course you can play with it anytime you want to see how that looks. And they calculate the density, well, they calculate the volumes and then the density of both of these things. And they keep a record of which object is larger, which one has the most volume, which one is heaviest, and which one has the most, ma uh, which one has the larger density. And then after they've done this a number of times, I think I make them do it 10 or 15 times, then they have to deduce some general rules. Are big things dense or are round things dense or are heavy things dense? And they find out that there actually is no serious, um, there, there is no connection among these things, which is something that they have a hard time believing, but it's the truth. Uh, right behind you here, we have kinetic friction. And we can generate a cube of, the, I have three different um, materials here, glass, plastic, or wood. Let's try glass first. Press the glass, come on. There, I've got our glass block, and then you press the go button, and off it goes. And now I'm seeing information about the velocity and the time as this thing slid down. You're not seeing it because, again, it's instant messaged, but you can, you know, go ahead, press some buttons and see what you get. Somebody else try it. And now the go button. So I would send my students back 
with this to make graphs. They would have to graph the velocity versus time, and then from that they would have to calculate the acceleration of the block and the coefficient of friction. <laughs> it, I think it's a lot of fun, and I think it, because we do these things in lab, but in lab they've got a little inclined plane and a little, little block that slides down. Here it's big, you, and you can do it over and over and over and over again. There's, there's, there's no limit to the number of trials you can have. And I think it just makes it a lot more fun. And over here, is buoyancy and volume displacement. Um, I'll tell you what, some, I don't like operating these myself because I'm the only one that gets to see the data. So if somebody else wants to try it, just press, oh, wait a minute. No, this one, actually everybody can see. If I press the down button, this sphere is slowly lowered into the water and the water overflows, as you can see. And the scale above that the sphere is hanging from shows you how much weight is on the chain. And the scale below shows how much, um, how much force the water or whatever that liquid is. Because actually I have three of these that students have to use. I just put one here for illustration. But there are three with three different liquids. And they'll give you three different forces. And so they have to end up telling me what each of these three liquids is. So as you see, every time you press the down button, the numbers change. So it's pretty fun. You can actually put it all the way down. Uh, although generally I don't make them do that. They usually just go halfway. But anyway, uh, as I say, they do three of these usually with three different liquids. And up here, I don't know, I've been having a hard time with this media on a prim. Yep, see? It doesn't seem to want to work now. But anyway, all right, I'm not even going to worry about it. Both of these signs over the sphere here and over the density comparison are supposed to show you web pages that show what the student's uh, homework looks like. Sometimes they seem to work, sometimes they don't. Probably a good idea. That's why for most of these things, I just made little explanatory placards instead of trying to use media on a prim. But I thought it would be interesting if people could see what it actually looks like, but I guess nobody's going to see that. <laughs> you can go out here. Okay, here we are. Is there somebody else here that I haven't that I didn't see? Okay. Okay, I should turn on my map here and see. No, it's just the three of us. Oh no, there are still a couple of people wandering here and there. Okay, goody. Well, anyway, uh, this is the lawn, and I have uh, mostly um, vector problems here and things having to do with one-dimensional acceleration. Oh, and I'm sorry, free fall. So over here, for example, this is where we look at acceleration for the first time. You can generate a little sphere and touch the sphere and off it goes. And it gives you information about its velocity and how much time it takes to transit between these two rings.
what I find when people visit here is that they will leave piles and piles of of spheres in front of the rings, but they never send them through. So, but but <laughs> but go ahead, play with them. It's fun, and you can see what kind of information you get from them too. Um, any okay? I'm pointing again on my screen. I've got to stop this. Any of these colored buttons on the stands in front of you? The blue, red. Okay, and now click on the blue sphere. Yep. Whoops. Okay. We've got several of them going here. Okay. So if we click on this, off it goes. And click here. Whoop. Now you've got two of them going through at once. That's all right. It's not going to not going to break anything. Well, one of the big problems that I found, and this is not a problem that is um, that's specific to deaf learners. This is a problem that's specific to naive science learners, is that they don't really understand where the trees end and the forest begins or the other way around. And um, when they're using unfamiliar measuring equipment to do an unfamiliar task, they don't know what they're supposed to concentrate on. And I have gotten wonderful uh, lab re reports that have told me exactly how to use a micrometer caliper. But that wasn't the point at all. The caliper was supposed to be a tool to get data to do other work with. And so one of the wonderful things about Second Life is that it takes all that uncertainty away. The equipment can do its own measuring. You know, like this here, you see the ball up here. You see it going through the, the detectors. And it tells you that the velocity is 0.67 meters per second at time zero seconds. And then the velocity is 3.18 meters per second and the time is 3.4 seconds. And then I can ask them all kinds of questions about that. But they don't have to, uh, they don't have to worry about how to measure these things. They're measured for them. And that, that takes a lot of, that takes a lot of the uncertainty out of it for students. And and then thrown things away too if they just weren't working for me. So I do have arrows over here in my vector space, but they don't they don't go anywhere. They just rotate. You can stop it, and you can show the x component, and you can show the y component. Whoops. And you can start it again. And let's let it go past 90 degrees and stop it again. And then the X and the Y components will adjust themselves. So this actually is not homework here. This is just for students to, to practice with so that they can calculate x and y components of vectors because it tells them the answer. You can see if you try it yourself, it'll IMU a lot of information. And it tells you what the answer is, so you can see if your answer matches what the machine's telling you. Yeah, I did. Okay, uh, yeah, now it's telling me what the final positions of these vectors are. And then the students are expected to add them all up and get one 
final answer from that. <laughs> Well, thank you. It's, it, it has taken me, this is probably the product of about five years of work. And, you know, sometimes I work on it very, very concentratedly. Other times I'll let it go for a long time. It depends on what else is going on in my life. So, but, uh, they are, most of them are students in, in two-year engineering technology programs. So most of them are headed for associate's degrees. And some of them are, are doing associate's degrees on their way toward transferring into one of the other colleges of RIT to get regular engineering degrees. It depends. It depends on the student. But yeah, most of my students are very, uh, this is very basic level physics. I would probably say it's somewhere between high school and college physics most of the time. But that's all right. Look at this and say, well, this is just a game. You know, why are we playing games? Why aren't you teaching us physics? And I say, no, it's actually not a game. But the point is that different people have different learning styles. This is going to help some of you more than others. But we're going to try to do as many different kinds of activities as we can. Because they do, of course, of course, they do actual lab activities on their lab bench in front of them. And they usually do an actual living real life lab before they come in here and then repeat it in second life so it, it's kind of trying to layer different experiences on top of each other up works <laughs> well let's see over here we've got research and development And here we're looking at ideal gas laws. Anyway, I have um, isobaric processes here, isothermal and isochoric processes. And let me see if we can do something here with um, increasing the temperature here of an isobaric process. So you hit the increase temperature button. Well, uh, again, this is instant messaging all the information to me, so if you would like to try it yourself, let me get it through one cycle. Okay, so you think heat went in or out of that process? Ah, I think, was, well, here, try, try hitting the decrease temperature button and see what happens. Yeah, decreased temperature. Now it should tell you that it's resetting. Okay, and now go ahead and press the decreased temperature button again. So it, what it was supposed to look like was that it was throwing some cold air up onto that cylinder and then you could see heat leaving it as the cylinder as the cylinder the piston actually came down so it it an isobaric process is one where the pressure is kept constant but you can change the volume and the temperature and over here where we've got an isochoric process i'm sorry i've got this table right in the way but this is something i started on and never finished because i don't like it very much um, <laughs> An isochoric process is a constant volume process. So the, the piston isn't going to change, but we can up the pressure and we can, or down the pressure, we can up and down the temperature too. So let's see. If we lower the pressure here, it's resetting. And now, this one isn't as much fun. There isn't as much to see. But you can see the temperature over here. The, the red bar over on the left is a thermometer, and of course the pressure gauge is over on the right. And it changes, let's see, let's do this again. Let's raise the pressure this time. So now it's resetting. All right, and now when we raise the pressure, 
there. You can see the, the pressure gauge goes up and the temperature didn't change very much at all. But because the, the script chooses numbers kind of randomly, sometimes there are big changes, sometimes there are very small changes. But since students do these things over and over again, they get to see different ranges. And the isothermal process where the, it's, <laughs> this is research and development. These things aren't finished yet. In the isothermal process, that means that the temperature is supposed to stay the same, but actually the temperature, the thermometer on this changes, which it's not supposed to. So I have to fix that.
and the students use this to um, to calculate the volume of either a sphere or a cube. They generate the cube, they drop it, the level of the water comes up, and again, an instant message tells me what the new level of the water is, and I calculate the volume of the cube from that. There, there, on the placard here, there's a picture of a, a granite cube and there's a picture, I'm sorry, a granite sphere and a picture of a cube. And you can click on either of those and it will generate one of them. And then click on the green button and it will drop. And then everything will reset itself. And you can see that it gives you some information. Mm-hmm the new height of the water because the level of the water comes up. Oh, this is a big one. That's fun. Again, this, the, the script chooses the sizes of the objects. So. So, I, so the students can use the same, the same piece of equipment over and over and over again and to get different sizes of objects to do the calculations over. And it's really fun if you just put in a whole bunch of these and see what happens because when they fall they become physical and when they become physical they can't <laughs> but since but since they die you know they just disappear so we're not littering the landscape but that's always fun just throw a whole bunch of these things in here <laughs> I discovered that the hard way. <laughs> they all go falling off the edge. Now this, the tanks on the corners with the blue water do this. Now the two tanks in the middle with the green water do something a little different. and you have to decide if it's going to float or if it's going to sink, then you drop it and see if you're right. So for example, there it is. And it tells me the mass, it tells me the volume. And let me see, I think it's going to float. Hmm? Oh, um, Tom, you can go ahead and, and catch the chat. And I, thank you, thank you, Vicki. This was magnificent. So goodbye, everybody. Um, I think there's only a couple of us left in here. Anyone who's watching this, um, go and look for the YouTube video from Nelly in the SL Move playlist because this particular recording from WizIQ will not show you everything we're doing. So see you soon. Bye now.